Hello, this is Carl Weinshank from the Daily New Music Break. I am thrilled to be speaking to Dr. Kent Gustafson, author of the book Blind, but now I can see a 2012 biography of the great Doc Watson. The book was the winner of the Next Generation Book Award and a finalist uh, in the Forward Magazine Book of the Year Awards. Welcome, Kent. How are you doing? Thanks. Thanks. I'm doing all right. Great. Well, again, thank you very much for joining. Um, you also are a music musician yourself, so before we start, could you please fill us in on what you were doing uh, musically and the thought leadership path? Well, musically, there's a portrait outside this this window, and I sit a lot on it and play a lot of uh, music on my <laughs> on mandolin and guitar and banjo and so forth, and that's pretty much it these days. Mm -hmm. um, which is great. I think I've fallen back in love with playing music um, since doing it academically kind of turned off the spigot of wanting to perform very much, but it's it's great to play for the crickets and the deer. I, I, I sense you might be a little bit modest. I read that you have some albums out. I do. I have a bunch of albums out. It's been, it's been a little while, but we're, uh, I've been working with several folks on different things as everyone is kind of during uh during this weird era we're in right okay and the thought leadership path before we get started yeah. on doc watson yeah so i'm uh i have this really cool new um thing i've been working on for about uh, half a year with a, a business partner down in austin called thoughtleaderpath.com and people can come check it out and visit basically lifting people up um democratizing thought leadership let's say it that way because the the term thought leader it's one of those scare quote terms just like expert or guru or whatever and um i'd love for more uh people who have real skills and real know-how to kind of be up in that category not just the people who can uh, pay a bunch of money but people who are real experts and can sort of read other people's hearts and minds beautiful well i'll put a link to that in the uh in the little blog I write along with this uh, interview. Cool. Um, I'd like to start with an, my observation of Doc Watson, and I wanted to see um, to what level that resonates with the guy who wrote the book about Doc Watson, or a book about Doc Watson, I mean, there's probably others. And the observation, I love Doc Watson. I mean, I just, I, I'm, I consider myself to be well-rounded and liking a lot of different types of music and right up there near the top is Doc Watson. I think part of it is that besides the, you know, unbelievably, unbelievable musicianship, um, Watson seemed to project a, a deep sense of dignity in what he was doing and a deep sense of grace when he, when he was doing it. And that's what I picked up. Um, the idea I got, was that or is that he was an extremely upright, respectful, and, and dignified man uh, who also just happens to be one of the, the great guitar players ever. Uh, you know, again, I wanted to get your reaction to that after having done all the research you did for the book. Yeah, I, I think one of the most amazing things about Doc um, uh, if anybody kind of went up to him and got an autograph or had a chance to, to listen into one of his conversations or watched him in any way throughout his career and life, he was a very humble person in public. Uh, so he was a very well-known person and he would often redirect and say, you know, thank you. I, it's all about the entertain. It's all about entertaining you. You know, it's all about, he'd always, you know, push it back towards his, uh, fans and and giving enjoyment to the, to to those people. I think that that humility comes from, you know, I mean, he really started having success in his 40s. So it, the the humility comes from that first half of his life. I think where he was living living the life, he had an amazing life in so many ways because he had his kids and his wife and simple life but he, they were struggling financially and in, 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 in many other ways and music was his solace and and joy but he wasn't making much money um, so I think the sort of thankfulness 
for being given this career to support his whole clan you know not just his wife not and kids but his whole his whole um community in a lot of ways i think the a lot of the gratefulness and humility comes from that and and the generation you know because he came from a you, you were you stood up straight you were proper you were you you respected one another you loved one another in that way you know um, um. I don't think I would have made it in that generation, but uh, maybe I, I'm, going to, I'm going to apologize to you. So I sent you a list of questions. I'm going to ask you a couple that weren't on the list. So I, I apologize. Yeah, it's and all the, good. the first one that strikes me is, did you have a to, uh, to meet Doc Watson? Yes, um, a, a couple of times kind of fringely. Um, I think, you know, towards the end of his life, he wasn't as amenable to sort of letting people into his circle with similar to Pete Seeger and a lot of other greats where it's just like, you know, you get up in your uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and you know, it, it's it's a lot to sort of meet fans and so on. So um, I had the chance to be close with a lot of people who were close to him, but I had a chance to, to, to chat with him and um, very briefly. Wow, that that's uh, that must be a treasured memory, actually. Yeah, I mean, what the the for me the biggest joy was speaking to. I mean, for me, Pete Seeger. Uh, right. He's another one on my list. Spoke to me for forty minutes about chopping wood and about <laughs> my mom as an educator and um, another amazing. I, I became really good friends with Clint Howard who was Doc's uh, lead singer way in the very early days, some of those early Smithsonian recordings. And I became buddies with Clint Howard, who was, you know, an old man, but he'd sit on his porch and he'd tell stories and play music. And um, But anyway, a lot of great people have amazing people around them. And so the, the, the real, the people who really opened to me were the people who were talking about Doc and, and people like, you know, Ben Harper and Darius Rucker and, um, we haven't put out the new edition of the book, but all these amazing interviews with these people who were fairly famous, but Revere Doc. You know, actually, Darius Rucker was funny. He, he was obviously a country star now, the uh, the lead singer of Hootie and the Blowfish back in the 90s. He talked about when they were on the top of the world, uh, you know, playing pop shows to, I don't know how many fans, like half a million people or whatever. On the tour bus, this rock and roll band would listen to Doc records over and over they just listen to doc watson records um and they he, he talks about when they went to merle fest way back in early 2000s and they had a chance to meet doc they ended up jamming with doc all night long on doc watson's tunes because doc was pleased of course that these rock star kids right. knew all his tunes <laughs> right it's it's kind of maybe tangentially related but maybe my favorite of Doc Watson is him in a hotel, small hotel conference room. You might have seen it with Chet Atkins and Leo Cotton. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And they're playing the last steam engine train, I think the name of the song is, which I think maybe Kotke wrote, I'm not sure. And um, it's just, it's, it's amazing because there's people hanging out in the back, you know, this is a while ago, so, you know, and becomes disinterested and walks out. It's just like, it, it had this sense of informality that, uh, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like a memory would be to someone who was there as opposed to, you know, formal setting. So let me ask you, and this question actually is on the list, is why did you decide to write a book about Doc Watson? Uh, I, like most things in life, I sort of stumbled into it. Uh, I. I, I've always been obsessed with biographies. So, uh, one of the first that I was really obsessed with was Maynard Solomon's book about Mozart. Uh, I think that was the one. Um, and Maynard Solomon was, uh, I believe one of the founders of folkways. Anyway, there's a funny connection there, but yeah. I studied classical music and got closer to my passion for American traditional music as I was getting more into sort of the heady realms of, you know, PhD land in classical composition. And so that's sort of how I gravitated towards looking at Doc more as this figure who actually was more like me than I had thought. I thought he was sort of the, the country 
you know, the, the stereotypical, you know, oh, I found this guy and he just, you know, Mississippi John Hurt, somebody who had just been, it's almost like they're iconic because they're so amazing and, and they were sort of rediscovered. Doc was different. He was, he was, he could play anything, He's, um, including that old traditional music and he could yeah. imitate the sounds of those people who were 50 years older than him, which, and well, then I, when I found that stuff out, I got obsessed. It's interesting because one of the questions I had for you is in, in, I'm not, <laughs> I'm about as opposite from a train music. I was actually asked to leave my, my junior high school. The leader of the band asked me to leave. I was going to even keep a beat on the drums. They said, you know, just not for you. Goodbye. <laughs> so that's, so that's, that's where I am in music, but I, I enjoy it. Um, where do you put him as related to question I have is, re is related to that. Where do you put Watson on kind of the family tree of American music? Was, I, I, you know, he, had, he does a version of Sitting on Top of the World, which is basically a known as a blues song. Um, where He seems like he's a hybrid, and it kind of relates to what you were just saying. Yeah, he would, he, he's, um, um, he's higher up on the tree than he should be, which is interesting. Like he, he's, he's up on the tree alongside his own sort of grandparent age type folks, which is, which is fascinating. Like the Clarice Ashley's of the world, that type of thing. Uh, even, even further. Yeah. But like, um, to, you know, Tom Ashley is that Clarence Ashley recording of the cuckoo, for example, he recorded right. in the twenties. Uh, he was a young, he was a kid, right? Clarence Ashley. Um, and so the generation of the people who were already in their 50s, 60s, 70s at that point, like that's the kind of music Doc does. Like he's, he's, he's like the skillet lickers. He's like the, um, you know, kind of like Hank Williams. He's the age of Elvis uh, and has that shuffle. He's the, he, he threaded, the thing about Doc is he threaded the needle between just about any genre um, and if you listen to any of the kind of outtakes from some of the festivals he did, uh, where he was teaching lessons, I don't know how many of those are released publicly now, but they should be. They're extraordinary. Where he'd give lessons to people and be like, "Oh, here's how to play rock. Here's how to play blues. Here's how to do this." He he understood it all, uh, and it was just remarkable. And but and Ralph Rinsler kind of shaped him early on to say, "Yes, but you really need to just play the old time." Uh, Appalachian music, because that's what people want to hear. And then as Doc, uh, Doc sort of uh, built up his own career, he started doing more of the stuff that he wanted to do, which is a lot like the Newgrass stuff. So guys like Sam Bush and Jerry Douglas and uh, Marty Stewart and that whole world of people um, that were doing, and even like Edgar Meyer and those kind of guys, they 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 all, uh, and of course David Grisman and and the and the Dead and and they all saw Doc uh, being in that traditional space, but able to play with anybody. Uh, and he, he didn't actually record any electric guitar stuff between the 50s and now, but there is there's one, um, uh, there are a couple of released recordings of Doc playing electric guitar, and he's pretty darn good from the 50s. So you're, you're, you're classically trained, and this resonated with you that here's this guy who's from from the country from the backwoods and he's just a um almost a polymorph kind of kind of person 100 you know? yeah, percent yeah that's... and at the time you know i i was hanging out at the time i i did a record called stolen shack which i'm really proud of with a trio and it's a harpsichord a an upright bass and me so basically it's sort of this appalachian slash baroque uh music and so i was experimenting with you know baroque music is full of improvisation jazz is full of improvisation and so is doc's music so is that you know appalachian uh stuff i was really into shape note uh old hymns uh you know uh qu quintal harmony instead of you know all these different elements of um, folk music that you don't see in classical music. And so the, you know, classical music, I, I was studying classical music composition, but at the same time, that means it's electronic music. It means it's 
aleatory, the sounds of nature or, and or like whatever. And it's also what I would do is um, I was obsessed with, you know, the music of Charles Ives, who when he was a kid, his dad would um, run two bands um, starting on two sides of the city and they'd sit in the bandstand in the middle and the two bands would cross right in the middle and then go back the other direction. <laughs> you see, I love the, the, the idea of birds singing and um, multiple sounds happening at the same time. And that's the world Doc occupies. His, mm -hmm. his, his talent for sound, if, if you just listen to any of his records, you know, from the 70s, some of it's cheesy when he wanted it to be cheesy, you know, like the, the sound of his baritone voice back in the 60s when he did those solo hymns, you know, mm -hmm. and am I born to die? And it's just stark. It's just his voice. And that, that was bold. Anyway, rambling again. No, no that's, that's great. I was thinking as you were talking, you know, I've written very um, primitive kind of blog, I'm sure, for people who are really trained in this about how nature, you know, instruments mime mimic the sounds of nature to a certain extent. Also things, you know, I was thinking of Washford Sam when you were talking actually. Oh man, yeah. Taking who's, I don't know why Washford, the, the name of one of my posts is Washford Sam Forgotten. I mean, he's, I mean, he is funny. I mean, he's, he's great. I love Washford Sam. And it's the idea is this, this thing that people had around their house. You have mm -hmm. nature, and you have the birds and the bees and everything, but you also have, you know, washboards, which are obviously still use in Zydeco. So it's all brought together, and it's just a, um, I guess you could keep peeling layers off the onion. And one of the great exemplars of this is, is Doc Watson. You know, and he in, did, in he, start, he, he started out, I mean, that's in, in all of his stories. He, he would always tell very similar stories. Uh, and I loved listening to the different variations because the, you know, when he tells a story five times and then the sixth time there's some strange detail that pops in, you know, it's like, is that, you know, where'd that come from? Right. But one, one he always talked about was, you know, he, he, he would rig up different sort of musical things. He'd bang on pots and pans and he'd take a whole shed and, and string something. So it was like a, a string on the shed and he'd he was just trying to get sounds uh and yeah. what i loved about also what i i found if you go back and listen to interviews with doc because maybe because he was blind maybe because he was a genius yeah. musician and singer but he found the melody in the notes and so um almost like a poet who repeats certain things certain things things yeah. doc would kind of say you know the sound of the wind as it went through the the fence, the fence, the wind as it went through the fence, you know, as I was walking, walking down the road. And you could edit that together as a writer. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to it, there's a reason he's doing the repetitions. They're not stumbles. It's a, it's, he's using the beauty of language and the beauty of sound uh, to actually almost, you know, inspire you uh, in certain ways. So I, I, He's a sound guy, and his interviews are almost as beautiful as his his music in a lot of ways. And his personality, you know, if you've seen Doc on stage, was he would you walk on stage, sit down, he'd say, "Up, oh, you're in my living room with me." First time you hear that at a Doc Watson show, it's like, "Oh wow, thanks." <laughs> it's it's great, and um, I guess it's funny. It almost like he could have been a scat singer too, because it, scat is using you know, the voice as an instrument. That's what. So now we have Louis, now we're into Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald. So oh yeah, getting well, broader. You know, yeah, and Doc, Doc grew up listening to the the race records and hillbilly records. So the the yeah. he'd go to the you know the record store and they they'd let him hear everything. Um, and he didn't you know he, he didn't see people's face. And Doc was blind anyway, so you didn't know yeah. if somebody was white or black. Right. I mean, if you listen to the Skillet Lickers, it's hard to tell. If you listen to some of those old blues records, it's hard to tell too. Maybe this would be a better world if everyone was blind, I guess, maybe. I, yeah, in a lot of ways, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, I, now his son Merle, I believe was named after Merle Travis, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, who's, um, you know, another very, very, very important figure. The one kind of bio, biographical thing I wanted to ask you is, is when my understanding is that Merle battled addiction and then he, he died in a tractor accident on their farm. You know, obviously that's the horror of horrors. How did that change? You know, could you say 50,000 feet, how that changed Doc Watson? How old was Doc Watson when that happened? I hate to put you on the spot, do you know? About 23 to, what was it, 85. So he was 60, 60 plus, 62, right. something. So you he was not a young man. Yeah. So, so, um, I'll be vague in, in terms of who told me different things, but, you know, in terms of, um, one of the most moving things I heard from many people was sort of the, the way that Doc reached out to Merle's friends and, you know, in the, in the, in the memorial service, um, someone described, you know, Merle kind of the, the spirit of Merle walking out of church and slamming the door. I think that the wind slammed the door, but like various things that were really moving and someone described, you know, Peter Rowan throwing in a, a bag of, of sort of stones or, or different things. Um, it just, it was really a shock to all of his friends, even yeah. though I think, um, I think I wrote in the book, um, I think Sam Bush was the one to say it, but several people said, you know, uh, was it the tractor? You know, really? so it was sort of that, yeah, you know, we all have people in our lives and we're like, oh, do you, you know, are you on that, you know, are you on the tractor? You know, it's the sort of, uh, you know. Sounds like Harry Chapin and driving. Yeah, and that, you know, it's it was just a tragic thing. I the the most heartbreaking thing for me is from what I've pulled out, um, just the misunderstandings within the family, within the greater world of who, what happened, um, what was the impact, and all of that. The the thing we can say for sure is Doc was heartbroken. His wife had a heart attack even right you know some somewhere very near after that i mean they were broken hearted uh merle was the their um i also talk about that in the book they had a you know a, a, they had a, a you know pregnancy and the, the child didn't didn't survive uh and when that happens merle came a couple years later and they were both very young he was the apple of their eye. They adored him a hundred percent. And when Merle, even when Merle did anything wrong, when he came home, it was, he was the, they, they adored him. So when he was gone, he was Doc's guide. He was Doc's best friend. He was there, the head of the business. He was everything. So. It, I will object here for people who aren't familiar. Merle um, Watson was a very, very, very talented guitar player in his own right. I also want to say that um, introduction to your book, which I read on Amazon, is terrific, and it, it deals with oh, thanks. You know, it's just great. Um, to bring this full circle, you obviously I wrote this here, and you see me glancing to the, not not very good at this new age stuff, you know. Um, so I'm glancing at my notes. The when I when I wrote out the questions, I, I knew obviously you you know about something before you write about about it, and now I learned that you actually had met Doc Watson, which even even if knew him slightly, it's it's something to have met someone who you're writing about as to have not met them. Um, what can you characterize? What if anything changed in how you feel about Doc Watson from when you started on the um, the endeavor to after having done it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing about writing any biography is um, the danger of the term uh, hagiography, or however you say it out loud, which is really putting somebody on a pedestal. Um, right. 
<clears throat> versus on the flip side kind of trashing them and, and bringing out all the dirty laundry because we all have those aspects of our life that we don't want to be public right but if you're a public figure it's kind of fair game both directions one is to just really worship the person the other is to just tear them to pieces uh, I didn't want to do either with Doc uh, and that was really challenging because he's revered by his audience um, so I had to decide how much um, reality to throw in there I think it is important to, to, to reflect on how young he was when he got married you know all the struggles they had to think about Merle's death uh, and how heartbreaking it was you know when the neighbors tried to pull the tractor off of Merle like that's important to know that he had those close friends and that it was that you know heartbreaking mm -hmm. um, and so what I wanted to achieve was kind of that middle ground where it shows that this guy is worthy of being revered for many things. Num number one, his influence on guitar worldwide. Every mm -hmm. great player of the acoustic guitar can trace their roots to Doc. Everyone. There are no exceptions because the technique, the styles, I mean, just like banjo relating back to Pete Seeger, as you know, most people don't know that, but yeah, absolutely. The styles of how to teach and play uh, banjo. Mm -hmm. Doc is guitar. But, but I've changed in terms of the things I know about Doc are so intimate that my feeling about him made him more human. Right. Because I uh, loved Doc as a musician, as, a, as this public figure who did all these great things. Now I know him as a human, maybe right. even the deep, dark parts of him as a human. And that right. changes, changes everything. But so, he's still an inspiration, yeah. So, so it's almost like a more real or more mature, mature meaning, he's, the he's whole flawed. picture. Yeah. Very flawed, right? Like every great human, they are, some are extremely flawed. We see that, you know, when all of a sudden every, the public figure we revered comes out and it's like, oh, <laughs> he didn't know all that. Um, right. But... Um, there are, you know, dark aspects to Doc's life um, that I didn't write about in the book and made a decision not to. Mm -hmm. uh, he himself was an extremely kind um, and wonderful mentor. If we stay in music, stay in par parenthood, stay in that kind of thing, extraordinary individual. If, if I had to suggest one YouTube video of Doc Watson to watch. I think mine would be the one I mentioned in the hotel room, but also um, of Deep River Blues, the Delmore Brothers song, and one where he's teaching it, and it's, it's kind of funny to someone like me because he's saying, "Well, then you do this and you do that." Doing it like, sure. You know, like yeah, he's no making trouble. he's doing it like he's yeah. making eggs, you know, and he realized like. That's really what he just did is basically impossible. Like, I'm, I know enough to know that that was impossible what he just did. You know? um, and nobody, <laughs> nobody has tone. The one thing that I, still no one has matched. Uh, so Ricky Skaggs has tons of amazing guitar players. Cody Kilby is extraordinary. I, I mean, they're uh, all these amazing flat pickers. But no one sounds like Doc. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. One of them was... He often used heavy strings. I mean, the way he used his sort of John Pierce pick, the way he thought about the melodies, it, just different. He, he, he was unique. Mm -hmm. What, again, I'm not, not meaning to put you on the spot. Everyone always says that before they put the person on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I'm good you, with being on the spot. Can you, can you think off the top of your head a couple of found on YouTube that, you would suggest a doc, someone who's interested in Doc Watson um, watches? Yeah, I mean, so so I'd say a couple of things. One is, um, I'll talk about records first. Cause so with certain people, you have to own the record and sit with it. So two records I would say you need from Doc Watson is this, the, the amazing Smithsonian Folkways collection of Doc's early stuff with Clint Howard and all the rest. Um, extraordinary just just google folkways 
uh, Doc Watson with Clarence Ashley. Uh, amazing records. Yeah. He played behind Ashley, right? I'm sorry to interrupt you. He was the, a, he he Ashley was he out played, front. He played so, and that those records are interesting. If you look on the tracks, the lead singer almost a bunch of the time is Clint Howard, the guy I was talking with before uh, about before. Doc was starting to emerge as a soloist. And then Clint or uh, Clarence Ashley was the front on a bunch of them as well. So it's a it's a fascinating record. It's worth reading all the notes and everything. It's it's beautiful. And then the other record people have to own is Will the Circle Be Unbroken, the first one. Holy cow! The way well, it was well, produced. Oh. That's like the Hall of Fame record with um, yeah. with everyone comes in and, and takes listen, a verse, right? They're all and they're all they're all pushing each other to a higher level yeah. so if you listen to earl scruggs if you listen to doc watson they're they're at their peak they're at their best there's merle travis and doc talking to merle travis and it just that's worth listening to those nitty gritty dirt band put that together is that that's right yep right. will circle right. and and um i love that record the, the later ones are fine too um and the other the other thing so youtube videos of doc um I love the ones from the 60s. If you can find there are a bunch of, um, you can find Doc uh, on TV. There's a couple of appearances he did on different shows. He was on Pete Seeger's show. He was on, uh, I think that was with um, Cl uh, Clarence Ashley Group. Uh, but just, I, I do a deep dive on Doc. See if you can find any of the old stuff. And then uh, look at his flat picking the guitar playing in the late 70s, early 80s, before Merle's death. There's no one who plays guitar better than Doc in the late 70s, early 80s. It's just that you can't play guitar like that. And he tore through guitars, too. He tore through acoustic guitars. He, he kind of broke them because they were, he just played them so hard uh, and extraordinary skill. Okay. Uh, well, we've uh, broken every rule in these kind of interviews in length, and my web person is going to scream at me, but that's, um, yeah, it, it is what it is. I'd like to thank you very much. It's been just, really enjoy your insights, and obviously love you have for Doc Watson. Um, it's just, it's just great, and I, I truly appreciate it, and. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah likewise. Thanks for thanks for reading it. I mean, it's been a while. I, it it deserves a new edition. It it was it came out right before Doc's death, which was you know really sad when Doc died. So the yeah. whole book is still written in the present tense. Uh, yeah. But it's um, he's he his is a remarkable story because Doc Watson's story is American music's story right. in a lot of ways. Yeah. In the great one again. So I'm even going to get in more trouble with my web person. The real great ones. There, the, I was thinking about this. The real great ones, there always is two stories. There's the, the music story, and there's the tie, in our case, to American music. And the greatest example of that is Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Revolutionized jazz, but also he is the American story for, for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons, which is a whole nother podcast. Yeah. But I find that to to be true and Duke Ellington, anyone, the real, the real great ones have both. They're not just jukeboxes. Yep. You know? Anyway. And, that's, and Doc's, Doc's story from, you know, being a little blind boy who actually lucked out to be blind because he had this wonderful education at the school for the blind, whereas right. his brothers were working. So it was a, <laughs> you know, kind of ironically thinking like, oh, you know, he actually got a wonderful education in music and uh, all the yeah. rest because of it. So, right. inspiring. Anyway, this is uh, Carl Weinshank. I'm finally getting to the end. Uh, this is Carl Weinshank for the Daily Music Break at www.dailymusicbreak.com. I would like to thank for his um, great participation today. Really appreciate it. Talk to you again. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.